To begin this afternoon's session, I would like to invite Dr. Vinyari Ratna, President of the SLMA. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, on behalf of the Sri Lanka Medical Association, uh, I would like to welcome all of you to uh, the clinical uh, monthly clinical meeting uh, today at uh, the SLMA. And we are uh, conducting this monthly cl clinical meeting today in collaboration with the Sri Lanka College of Dermatologists. This year, 2023, Sri Lanka Medical Association's uh, theme is he uh, Human Healthcare Excellence equity and community. Human healthcare means that we would like to get connected more to the patient, to the people, and we would like to uh, provide a health service of quality and also uh, with a very ethical uh, orientation. So that's why we chose the theme towards human healthcare. And in order to achieve that, we need to have excellence in our uh, service delivery, whether it is from a preventive perspective or from a clinical perspective. So these monthly clinical meetings are in fulfilling that objective of the SLMA to update our doctors, our medical officers with the current knowledge and practices with regard to uh, better management of uh, the uh, disease conditions that we are faced with today. And also, uh, we look at equity, that is, how can we provide a health service that is fair by everyone. Some people in our country, although we have a, a free health service, do not have access uh, in the same way uh, when compared to some other communities and groups. So we need to address those differences that we see, which are reflected in our indicators, whether it is the infant mortality rate or maternal mortality rate. So we have to, as a country which has achieved a lot in the healthcare system, um, in delivering uh, uh, good health services and thereby reducing morbidity and mortality and uh, having a status of health which is comparatively better than our Asian neighbors. So uh, addressing equity is an uh, other important element. Then finally, to connect with the community. In all our work, we like to involve the community public and keep them informed, keep them educated so that they can also be part of the response to all the health problems that we are having and particularly in relation to preventing and also patient compliance and all that. So it is my great pleasure to welcome all of you, those who are joining uh, in person at the uh, Lionel Auditorium here today at SLMA and also those of you who are joining online by Zoom. So I wish to, on behalf of the SLMA, uh, welcome our resource persons uh, for this uh, clinical meeting today, which is on cutaneous T-cell lymphomas, varying presentation. So we have a lead, lead lecture followed by uh, two case presentations and a, uh, a quiz and MCQs on general dermatology. So we have Dr. Janaka Akaravita, sorry, a consultant dermatologist at the National Hospital of Sri Lanka, and also Dr. Kishani Rajakaruna and Dr. Amanda Dantanarayana, both are registrars in dermatology at the National Hospital of Sri Lanka. Then uh, Dr. Bhagya Fernandu, senior registrar in dermatology at the National Hospital of Sri Lanka. It's a great uh, pleasure and honor for me to welcome uh, all of you as resource persons to this joint <coughs> clinical meeting organized by SLMA and the uh, Sri Lanka College of uh, Dermatologists. And I would like to welcome uh, again all of you who are attending uh, this session in uh, person and also those who are joining. I hope that this will be a, a very useful learning experience for all th those uh, who are joining. And then we will have the recording also in our uh, SLMA YouTube and those of you who are not members of SLMA, I would like to request all of you to join as members of SLMA because you will gain a lot to update your knowledge as well as you can get involved in the various activities of SLMA. Thank you very much. The overlying topic for this afternoon is cutaneous T-cell lymphomas varying presentations. 
And the first speaker is Dr. Amanda Dantanarayana, Registrar in Dermatology, National Hospital of Sri Lanka. Thank you very much for your uh, kind introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dr. Amanda Dantanarayana, Registrar in de uh, Dermatology at NHSL. So let's move to the first case presentation. My patient is a 67-year-old male with a background history of long-standing diabetes mellitus, dyslipidemia, hypertension, ischemic heart disease and underwent CABG three years ago. He presented to us with asymptomatic plaques over the face, scalp, chest, abdomen and back for three months. Those lesions were started on the face and prog progressively involved the other areas of the body. He denied any mucosal involvement, no photo exacerbation, but he had recent onset loss of appetite and loss of weight. No other constitutional symptoms such as fever or night sweats. No other systemic involvement. He was a barber, married and having children, non-smoker, ex-alcohol consumer. So, uh, on the presentation at NHSL, these are the photographs we have taken. His general examination was normal and he was well looking. As you, as you can see, we can appreciate there are multiple well demarcated skin color to erythematous plaques. Some of them had fine scales and some of them had violaceous hue. And also these lesions were mainly over the face back and chest and uh, we also uh, thoroughly uh, examined this patient but he didn't have any peripheral nerve thickness, no madurosis or ear infiltration, those features suggestive of leprosy. So there are few pictures, you can appreciate those features that I have already mentioned. So considering his history and this examination findings. So what can be the differential diagnosis? We first thought, first differential diagnosis was cutaneous T cell lymphoma. And also, we thought of borderline lepromatous leprosy with type 1 reaction and sarcoidosis lower in the list of differential diagnosis. Actually, when this patient come to NHSL, he was initially treated at local hospital with multiple causes of steroid, thinking of this patient is having leprosy with reaction. Unfortunately, there was no good response to these treatments and he came to us. So we thoroughly investigate this patient and his basic investigations were normal including serum calcium that was normal and the blood picture there were no atypical lymphocytes and we did ultrasound abdomen there were no hepatosplenomegaly or paraiotic lymphadenopathy his ultrasound neck and axilla there was a multinodular goiter and there was suspicious submandibular and axillary lymphadenopathy we want to exclude leprosy, so we went ahead with slit skin mere of leprosy, but bacillary index was zero. MAN2 test was negative, and we did multiple punch skin biopsies, and we sent for histopathology. While in the ward, after about one week, what happened? The patient developed acute ulceration of the skin lesions, and they were very painful. And also, patient had significant facial swelling and patient became unwell. So these are those, uh, these are these, uh, that pictures. And you can see uh, there are some uh, ulcerations of that plaque lesions. 
and facial edema in this patient. And this picture shows after two to three days about this ulceration, which are healing with scap formation. Then we repeated all the basic investigation, but except total protein and serum albumin, which were normal, the, all the other basic investigations were normal. So now I'm going to present you what were the histopathology features. So you can see uh, in this slide, there are multiple epidermotrophic lymphocytes in the epidermis and dermoepidermal junction. And also there were multiple dermal infiltration of lymphocytes, mainly uh, uh, in the periappendageal and perivascular areas of the dermis with atypical lymphocytes with large nucleus. So we requested for immunohistochemistry and I have the slides uh, CD3, CD4 positive and CD8 and CD30 immune markers all were positive and the patient had KI67 proliferative index, which is high, it is about 70%. So, what is the final diagnosis of this patient? Though this patient had lymphadenopathy, those were dermopathic lymphadenopathy and there were no malignant infiltration. So, according to the TNMB's classification, the patient had mycosis fungoides with TNMB stage 2B. Then we referred our patient to oncology team at Maharagam Hospital. There, he was underwent multiple chemotherapy. They have given intravi intravenous gemcitabine. So, as a conclusion, we have to keep in our mind that initial stages of cutaneous T-cell lymphoma may mimic the other common skin conditions. Also, the commonest forms of cutaneous T-cell lymphomas have indolent cause, but some forms can be aggressive. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Amanda. <coughs> Next up, we have Dr. Kishani Rajakarana, Registrar in Dermatology, National Hospital of Sri Lanka. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm uh, Dr. Kishan Rajakarana, Registrar in Dermatology at National Hospital, Colombo. So I'll proceed with the second case presentation. So this patient was a 30-year-old mother of two children uh, from Kurunagala, presented with worsening of her chronic skin condition, which started in 2008. Uh, so at the time of her presentation, uh, she complained of general aspiritis, dryness, and dispigmentation predominantly involved in the double covered areas and upper limbs for four months. Along with that, she had a painful right side axillary lump with the pus discharge. Uh, so apart from these symptoms, she denied any constitutional symptoms and there were no history, uh, there were no features to suggest connective tissue dis diseases and there were no history of exposure to radiation or chemicals and her uh, family history was uh, unremarkable. Uh, so, uh, and the rest of the systemic inquiry was also negative. Uh, coming to the examination, the examination of skin revealed generalized cirrhosis, and there were these uh, ill-defined areas of uh, macules with both hyper and hyperpigmentation, giving rise to the characteristic mottled skin appearance, along with the telangiectasia and the cutaneous atrophy. These uh, skin fine. Uh, Features were mainly confined to the uh, double covered areas and bilateral upper limbs and thighs, uh, accounting for 40% of the body surface area. 
and she also had this right side axillary uh, tender lump with the pus discharge. There were no lymphadenopathy, uh, and rest of her uh, general and systemic examination were normal. So this is a, a photograph of her uh, back of the chest. Uh, Uh, these are the areas of these are the areas of uh, uh, macular hyper and hyperpigmented uh, lesions uh, with cutaneous atrophy and telangiectasia. Uh, so this is a photograph of anterior aspect of the chest. Same changes are noted in the bilateral breast and the lower abdomen. Uh, this is a close-up view of the anterior chest. Uh, I presume you can see the uh, mottled skin appearance and the uh, cutaneous atrophy uh, and the telangiectasia as well. So the similar clinical changes are also seen in the bilateral thighs and uh, arms. So, uh, so these are the main uh, uh, cutaneous features which our patient had macular pigmentary changes, cutaneous atrophy, and the telangiectasia. So the, uh, when all these three, all these uh, features are present together, we call it, we uh, refer to it as poikiloderma. So there are various causes of acquired uh, poikiloderma. Uh, some of the main etiologies I have listed here. Uh, so there are uh, various causes uh, there are various infective and inflammatory causes giving rise to poikiloderma, and uh, metabolic uh, diseases such as amyloidosis uh, known to cause poikiloderma. And uh, poikiloderma is also a, a common manifestation in connective tissue diseases like dermatomyositis, lupus, and systemic sclerosis. And the neoplastic changes like uh, mycosis fungoids is also a known cause for acquired poikiloderma. And, uh, uh, various exposures uh, like chemicals, radiation, and drugs can uh, induce uh, acquired poikiloderma. So uh, coming back to our patient, uh, since she had obvious poikiloderma, our DDs were uh, cutaneous T-cell lymphoma and connective tissue disorders. However, in her history and the examination, there were no features to suggest connective tissue diseases. So on further analysis of her uh, past medical history, we found out that uh, she was uh, uh, investigated uh, for the same condition on several occasions since 2008. Repeated uh, investigations were done, including the bone marrow biopsy and the skin biopsy. And she was treated with several cycles of phototherapy and methotrexate. Uh, and this is the skin biopsy, which was done in 2015. And it showed uh, features consistent with mycosis fungoids. And the uh, latest biopsy, which was done in 2021, revealed poikilodermatous mycosis fungoids with predominantly CD4 positive. And then uh, after that, the staging investigation were carried out and it, uh, they were normal. So during this presentation also, we repeated the same investigation and they were found to be normal. And uh, we were concerned about the right side axillary lesion. We, uh, we performed a uh, surgical uh, excision biopsy. Although we thought it could be a lymph node at the beginning, uh, it turned out to be a, a sinus tract with granulation tissue without evidence of lymphoid tissues of mycosis fungoids. So at the end, uh, we arrived at the diagnosis of poikiloderma's mycosis fungoids, TNMB stage 1b. So a little word about uh, TNMB classification. Uh, if there's a limited uh, skin involvement involving less than 10% of the total body surface, we take it as T1. So if there's a generalized involvement uh, involving more than 10% of the body surface area, it's taken as T2. So our patient had T2. And uh, since our patient didn't have uh, any um, lymph nodal or visceral involvement, uh, both N and M stage was uh, zero. So uh, according to the clinical staging patient, uh, had one stage 1P. Uh, so based on the uh, staging, we initiated the treatment uh, with topical steroids and emollients, UVB therapy, and systemic uh, treatment with acetratine and methotrexate. So she's been followed up at our unit for nearly six months now with a fairly good control of her symptoms. So, uh, 
So take home message from my presentation is the mycosis fungus has various clinical uh, clinical variants and uh, different cl clinical presentations. So one such variant is poikiloidomatous mycosis fungoids. It's rare uh, and it has an indolent cause. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kishani. I would now like to invite Dr. Janaka Karavita, consultant dermatologist, National Hospital of Sri Lanka, to speak to the audience. Good afternoon to all of you. Um, so first, I thank uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association, its council, for <clears throat> continuing uh, these CME activities and give, uh, giving uh, a forum for us to present. So I will be talking about uh, briefly about different types of cutaneous T cell lymphomas, the presentations how to evaluate and uh, brief uh, mention about what the treatments available. <clears throat> Primary cutaneous lymphomas, that's the, uh, the whole group, comes under non-Hodgkin lymphomas, which present in the skin without extracutaneous disease at the time of diagnosis. So, but they exhibit distinct clinical histological, immunophenotypic, and genetic features compared to the systemic lymphomas. Further, they differ in prognosis and treatment from systemic lymphomas with similar histological changes. The primary cutaneous lymphomas, that is including B and T both, uh, it is a very rare condition, but anyway accounts for about one-fifth of cases of extranodal lymphoma. Interestingly, incidence of both cutaneous B cell lymphomas and cutaneous T cell lymphomas has continued to increase dramatically and consistently over the past three decades. So that is an important uh, thing for us to be in alert. Then um, about cutaneous T cell lymphoma, so out of the whole group, T cell lymphomas consist about 75% of the all cutaneous lymphomas with slight male preponderance and uh, incidence of uh, the presentation is in the elderly about 50 and 60 years. But uh, younger presentation has been uh, noted in non-white individuals, especially uh, in the Asian population. One reason may be we see a lot of hypopigmented MF variant, which is easily visible in the pigmented skin compared to the uh, fair skin. So that may be one reason why it is in a younger generation has more involvement. The incidence of second malignancy is high in these patients with cutaneous T cell lymphomas, uh, not only due to the immunosuppressive effect, probably due to the disease uh, activity itself. The survival is largely uh, stage dependent. Early stages can have normal five year or 10 year survival rates. But if the stages are, uh, I mean, the uh, severe stages, the lifespan is slightly uh, less. So, this is a list of uh, the groups coming under cutaneous T cell lymphomas. You can see there are, I mean, many. Uh, disease uh, groups uh, in, in under these groups there are some other variants as well so it is a bit of a long list so i am not going to uh, talk uh, on individual uh, condition we i will be talking about a uh, few of them So in this chart you can see with the frequency of occurrence incidence with the 
five years survival. So mycosis fungus is, is the commonest form and uh, with fairly good uh, five years survival rate. Then there are uh, mycosis fungus variants which have sometimes 100% survival rate at five years. And then primary cutaneous uh, lymphoma CD30 positive, lymphoproliferative disease. So then again, uh, we have got uh, these conditions with uh, uh, primary cutaneous anaplastic large cell lymphoma and lymphomatoid papillosis, which uh, have a good prognosis. Then uh, the other common variant we see is subcutaneous panniculitis like T-cell lymphoma, again with good prognosis. But these are rarer variants having aggressive disease and poor prognosis. So they are, luckily they are compared to the others, it's rare. So we'll talk about mycosis fungus, it's the commonest type of primary cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. The etiopathogenesis of myco MF remains basically not much explained. Uh, maybe with chronic antigen stimulation with background genetic uh, predisposition and some chemical exposures, sometimes medications. And also the geographical clustering has been described, probably due to some environmental triggers. and. Uh, sometimes a uh, couple of family members may be involved in, with the same disease. Uh, the presentation uh, can have uh, different forms, can present as chronic itch, so without any skin lesions initially, but later on they will develop skin lesions. And the classic M M MF progresses slowly over years from patches to plaques and may eventually form tumors over the years. However, uh, most of these conditions, uh, I mean, cases are diagnosed with early stage disease. So we have patch stage, plaque stage, and tumor stage. So those are the uh, basic stages of MF. In patch stage, you get poorly defined, irregular, fine scaly red patches of variable size, often with some skin atrophy or wrinkling appearance. Uh, mainly over the covered areas, that is uh, probably the ultraviolet light present in the sunlight has some protective effect against this uh, lymphoma, so it is mainly in the covered areas of the body, often asymptomatic. Uh, the hyperpigmented variant is very important for us because the, that is the condition which we see most and uh, like uh, so probably the pigmented skin, pale finely scaly patches without atrophy in uh, sometimes even in children with the uh, colored skin. The other form is follicular derma, which uh, Kishani described about the features and things. And uh, so that is another form of presentation of mycosis fungus. In the plaque stage, they are well demarcated annular or arciform itchy thickened lesions. Uh, they are plaque, that is elevated lesions, color often red, violaceous or brown, sometimes can be scaly. Individual plaques can, uh, can get together and uh, form uh, uh, confluent lesions as well as there may be central uh, regression. Uh, so some, it, initially it will be smaller areas of the body, but with time it will spread to the other areas. A tumor stage, when the lesions are more than one centimeter vertical uh, depth, uh, we can put them as the tumor stage. Deep red violaceous color often shines with shiny surface can be seen. Then there are other presentations, uh, syringotrophic, where the um, glands are infiltrated with the uh, lymphocytic infiltration, then bullous mycosis fungoides, solitary lesions can occur rather than widespread lesions, then uh, palms and soles can get involved with hyperkeratosis, and also some conditions can, uh, I mean, mimicking the other non-malignant conditions, this uh, MF can present like pigmented purpuric eruptions which occurs in the lower limbs with due to capillaritis. Then granular annulari like acanthosis nigricans like pyoderma gangrenosum like and uh, even the common conditions like vitiligo, ichthyosis and psoriasis uh, mimicking those conditions, the MF can occur. 
So these are the mycosis fungoides variants. Uh, uh, this uh, folli uh, follicular trophic mycosis fungoides and uh, pagetary reticulosis and granulomatous slack skin disease. So they are basically uh, sort of uh, having a bit of localized disease. Um, in uh, follicular trophic variant, it is mainly in the face, upper part of the body, uh, around, around the hair follicles, the infiltration is then the hair loss may be there. In pagetary reticulosis, it will be a solitary lesion, prolonged, uh, slowly progressing lesion. And granulometrous like skin disease occurs in the skin folds, and generally that itself is not uh, having a bad prognosis. Cesare syndrome is uh, rare and aggressive form of cutaneous T cell lymphoma, and uh, presenting with erythroderma, with the other two features, generalized lymphadenopathy and presence of neoplastic clonal T cell, the Cesare cells in the skin, lymph nodes, and the peripheral blood. Uh, so it progresses then mycosis fungus, I mean, progresses rapidly then mycosis fungus and has worse prognosis. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, both in MF and Cesare syndrome, these patients show some immunosuppression and they are at a higher risk of infection and uh, decreased anti-tumor immune response, so they have a chance of developing other tumors as well. Uh, these are the group coming under uh, CD30 positive lymphoproliferative disorders, uh, primary cutaneous uh, and a plastic large cell lymphoma and lymphomatoid papillosis. Generally, they have better prognosis and having nodular or uh, discrete lesions and uh, sometimes spontaneous regression can be seen. In lymphomatoid papillosis, the lesions occur in the trunk uh, they uh, sometimes become necrotic and then heal with the scar. Subcutaneous paniculitis like T cell lymphoma. So if they present like paniculitis, then uh, they have a plaque and nodular lesions, or uh, there may be some erythema overlying. Lesions may be self healing, mainly over the uh, lower limbs. Sometimes trunks and upper limbs can get involved and uh, can be associated with other autoimmune diseases. Generally, they have a good prognosis, if not associated with hemophagocytic syndrome, uh, which can have an aggressive disease uh, cause. Now we will go through some uh, clinical pictures. So hyperpigmented variant. Um, so that is, I mean, very slight, I mean, uh, very uh, ill-defined hyperpigmented patches over the double covered area. That is, uh, usually there are two layers of cloth in this area. So she doesn't have any other patches on the other areas. So the buttock is one common place uh, to start these conditions. And in, when in the next patient, you can see the hyperpigmented patches, uh, uh, ill-defined, and sometimes there may be a little bit of fine scale and asymptomatic most of the time, or maybe pruritic. Then when it uh, progresses, it can uh, progress into the trunk as well as, uh, I mean, other areas, uh, proximal part of the limbs. Here you can see oval-shaped lesions with hyperpigmentation, ill-defined margins. It's the same patient. And in this patient, you can see similar hyperpigmented patches and bit of uh, poicular derma here, uh, hyperpigmented patches. Possibly, uh, she is going to develop tumor stage uh, with these erythematous shiny uh, nodular lesions. And this is again a patient with follicular dermatous changes in the buttocks and the breast. In this patient, you can see the changes very clearly. In this male patient, a uh, lot of skin atrophy is uh, clear and hyperpigmentation in uh, poikuloderma, you get uh, telangiectasia and uh, pigmentary changes. And in this patient, again, uh, you can see a bit of pigmented lesions as well as poikuloderma. In some patients, you may have uh, different morphological uh, lesions in different body sites. Uh, again, uh, there is a pigmented plaque here. And uh, in this patient, having a poikuloderma patch on the 
And the classic mycosis fungoides will have pigmented lesions. Um, it's the same patient, the buttock area and the trunk. You can see the buttock is mostly, I mean, predominantly knolled with a bit of scaly, ill-defined margins and uh, prolonged uh, course, uh, long-term history and gradually spreading lesions. So again, uh, hyperpigmented mycosis fungoides. Uh, uh, pigmented lesions uh, with the uh, covered area getting involved and there are many other uh, different uh, presentations of uh, cutaneous lymphomas so in this patient you can see some areas of follicular derma as well as lichenoid eruption so lichenoid eruption is lichen planus like eruption violaceous patches and plaques control areas uh, seen widespread disease and this patient, uh, I mean, uh, somebody, I mean, we can get uh, misled thinking this as psoriasis, but this patient was rapidly spread, I mean, having uh, uh, non-responding lesions and um, so a bit of erythema all over so that uh, the biopsy, I mean, though clinically it looks like psoriasis, uh, the biopsy was done with the clinical suspicion and found to have mycosis fungodis, the psoriasis form lesions. Erythroderma is uh, another common presentation. Uh, erythroderma is a condition where the patients, uh, the various etiological factors can uh, contribute uh, for a patient to uh, come into a stage of erythroderma. Commonly it is due to psoriasis or type of eczema and sometimes drugs, but mycosis fungoides or cutaneous T-cell lymphoma is uh, a condition which we should exclude if we don't have any previous records, if the patient has no uh, clear-cut uh, evidence of psoriasis, eczema, etc., then always we try to exclude uh, cutaneous T-cell lymphomas when they present with erythroderma or the inflammation of the uh, whole skin. So this is a patient with tumor, tumor stage uh, mycosis fungus. You can see the uh, very shiny uh, erythematous uh, uh, indurated thick lesion. Then uh, follicular trophic MF is um, uh, mainly in the upper part of the body. Uh, sometimes they have hair loss and uh, indurated uh, lesions are there in the in this both patient. Uh, on the left hand side you can see it much prominently. And this patient um, had this lesion for about five years and uh, it looks like a patch of tinea, and actually she had been treated for tinea several times, but the lesion has not uh, changed at all, and remaining at the same time, not spreading to the other areas. I mean, tinea will spread to the other sites. So later on, when the biopsy was done, uh, found to be vegetative reticulosis. So that's uh, the typical, uh, I mean, appearance, and uh, it's a typical site for that, and single lesion. And this patient um, uh, presented with this slightly tender swelling over the thigh for about six to seven months duration. And if, I mean, in the photograph you may not see, but uh, this area was very much indurated. And you can see at the board erythema, bit of reticulate appearance with a bit of scaling. Um, so uh, when we did the biopsy, it showed uh, subcutaneous panniculitis like T cell lymphoma. So this is a patient who had undergone uh, treatment for ketone uh, T cell lymphoma about 20 years back and come in with these scaly patches and the biopsy showed again a relapse of the disease. There are very, I mean, in, in the, I hope you can appreciate in the photograph, scaly patches over this uh, inner aspect of the arms. So uh, regarding the evaluation of the patient, uh, when a patient comes, uh, these are the areas we should uh, concentrate, uh, physical examination, then the biopsies, then the hematological assessment, radiological imaging, and other required uh, body side biopsies. The physical examination should evaluate the type of lesion, body areas affected, and all peripheral lymph node groups, and abdominal examination, especially for hepatosplenomegaly. Uh, then the skin biopsy, the biopsy, uh, generally we take a punch biopsy with a deep component. I mean, we have to take a deep biopsy to uh, assess the uh, 
have follicular involvement in certain situations. And when there are multiple lesions, we have to take multiple biopsies. Sometimes one biopsy may not catch the uh, real disease stage. And uh, if, especially if there are different morphological lesions, then we have to take biopsy from each of the lesions. And uh, that will be used for the uh, HNE uh, sections as well as should be evaluated for the immunohistochemical markers. And uh, then if possible, uh, this uh, T cell receptor uh, clonality to be demonstrated. This uh, slide showing the patch stage of mycosis fungoides, epidermotrophism, that is lymphocytes uh, infiltrating into the epidermis and uh, atypical different, uh, I mean, large uh, size lymphocytes and uh, uh, with a uh, lot of lymphocytic infiltrate in the upper dermis and the junctional zone. So that is uh, some features of uh, mycosis fungoides. And uh, here you can see the large uh, atypical lymphocytes. And uh, this is the staining for cell markers. So any lymph node more than uh, 1.5 centimeters or greater should be further assessed by either imaging or biopsy and uh, to confirm whether it is involved or not and also to rule out other conditions. And uh, sometimes, uh, and most of the time when we do the lymph node biopsy, it comes as dermatopathic or reactive lymphadenopathy. So that uh, that is described with the uh, different uh, architectural changes by the pathologist. Then uh, complete blood count, uh, LDH levels, and metabolic profile should be performed. Then chest radiograph and the other uh, imaging uh, should be done to uh, complete staging. So depending on the availability and the, st I mean, the clinical situation, we may go, go for radiological evaluation of the whole body initially as well as for the staging. Then uh, hematological evaluation is an important part. Uh, if we suspect about the cesare syndrome, you should uh, count them, I mean, the, assess the number of cesare cells. Um, flow cytometry offers an objective test of uh, potential blood involvement, assessing these uh, various cell markers and the uh, relative uh, presence of them will indicate the involvement as well as uh, some uh, prognostic aspects. Bone marrow biopsy is not generally, I mean, always recommended, but the, unless there is an unexplained hematological abnormality and uh, exclusive of abnormal lymphocytic population. So then uh, as Kishani described, uh, we can uh, uh, follow the staging with this TNMB uh, classification. Then uh, regarding the tumor, that is the skin, then lymph node, then visceral involvement that is the liver, spleen, etc. other than the blood, then the blood involvement for the, uh, that is uh, by assessing the uh, circulating atypical cells. Then the staging is, uh, uh, stage is calculated uh, following this uh, chart. So if the cutaneous T cell lymphoma is, uh, I mean, uh, not attended, uh, then uh, they can progress into the other syst uh, systemic involvement. Usually, the diagnosis can get delayed due to indolent cause, clinical similarity to inflammatory dermatosis, and subtle changes in histopathology. Initial biopsies may not be very conclusive. So then we need to keep on uh, repeating the biopsies uh, maybe every six months if the clinical suspicion is strong. Uh, cutaneous lymphoma may, lesions may progress into ulceration and sometimes lead to scarring as well. The extracutaneous spread is the most uh, problematic issue. It can occur in about 10% of patients. And uh, so that will uh, indicate poor prognosis. And the quality of life can be significantly impacted due to these lesions, uh, including the appearance as well as the economic issues for the patient and the family. Uh, regarding the treatments, uh, it is considered as treatable 
uh, multidisciplinary uh, approach is the ideal way of treating these patients. Uh, so the treatment considered will depend on the individual patient factors, uh, the age, the uh, comorbidities, etc., and specific type of C CTCL and the stage of the disease, as well as local expertise, as well as uh, drugs and the equipments available. So initial stages, we may follow wait and see approach, not to rush for treatment. So skin-directed topical treatments are the mainstay of early disease. Topical steroids, phototherapy, we can use ultraviolet A, ultraviolet B. Um, then uh, the other topical preparations can be used. Uh, some of them are not available with us at the moment. And also local radiotherapy for individual lesions. Surgical excision can be considered in, uh, if the number of lesions are less. Um, so this is the list of uh, oral uh, preparation systemic treatments. Oral retinoids and low-dose methotrexate can be used. Um, I mean, we are uh, familiar with those drugs and we can uh, use them in certain situations. Then uh, total skin radiotherapy or electron beam therapy, immune modifier, modifiers, then uh, monochemotherapy or multi-agent chemotherapy. And uh, if we want for a cure at the, I mean, as last resort, allogenic hemopoietic stem cell transplantation is a treatment option in severe disease. And uh, these are the newer agents which have been added to the treatment armamentarium. Uh, Brentuximab vedotin is anti-CD30 monoclonal antibody. And Mogamulisumab is anti-chemokine uh, receptor 4. So those, are, can, those can be used after assessing with the uh, cell markers. I have just uh, included this as a summary of the treatments available. And um, I think uh, I have, have passed in time. So th these are the, I mean, uh, stages. And these are the available treatment options. Sometimes we perform one and maybe combine with the others. And these uh, the highlighted ones are the recommended therapies at different stages. So CT cells are rare but can present in different morphology uh, mimicking other diseases since leading to delay in diagnosis. Clinical pathological correlation is required to arrive at a precise diagnosis. A multidisciplinary approach is the ideal way of management. Aggressiveness of treatment depends on several factors, including type and stage of the cutaneous T cell lymphoma. So these are my references, and uh, thank you for your kind attention. I think uh, if there is any questions, we can discuss at the end. Thank you, sir. I would now like to call upon Dr. Bhagya Fernando, Senior Registrar in Dermatology, National Hospital of Sri Lanka, for the picture quiz and MCQs on general dermatology. Thank you for kind introduction. I'm Dr. Bhagya, Senior Registrar in Dermatology. Uh, there are uh, 15 picture quiz, and uh, I will give you one minute. At the end of one minute, we will discuss each case. I will read questions for you. 65-year-old uh, previously on-screen male admitted with right lower limb necrotizing fasciitis and acute kidney injury had undergone right bilony amputation and receiving IV antibiotics for eight days duration, complaining of generalized skin desquamation for two days without mucosal involvement, because his eye was positive, most likely diagnosis. Here there is superficial skin desquamation, and underlying skin is pigmented, and Nikolsky's kind, but uh, we are applying lateral pressure over the 
per lesion of skin which result in dislodge of upper layer of the epidermis from the lower layer and there are also superficial blisters over here So it's a case of Staphylococcus cold skin syndrome. Uh, it's due to Staph aureus exotoxins. It's common in children due to lack of protective antibody formation and immaturity of the kidney. Due, because of that, there is inability of excret of excretion of toxins. But it's rarely seen in adults due to impaired immunity or impaired renal functions and with inability to excrete exotoxins. Here. Uh, usually exotoxins attack uh, desmoglein 1 in granular layer so so that's desquamation is more superficial and our worry is whether this is SSS or toxic epidermal necrolysis in SSS we have to treat with IV antibiotics toxic epidermal necrolysis usually due to drug reaction and we have to stop the Culprit antibiotic, whether to proceed with treatment or to stop the treatment is crucial. So here, how to differentiate toxic epidermal necrolysis? Uh, compared to here, there is skin is pigmented. This looks much paler, toxic epidermal necrolysis, and there is impending skin necrosis. You can appreciate there is uh, dusky skin, which is impending skin necrosis. And compared to uh, SSS, there is, uh, there is no mucosal involvement, but here you can appreciate there is mucosal in both eyes and uh, oral mucosa involved. So this is a case of SSS. Twenty-five-year-old nursing officer presented with uh, asymptomatic skin lesions over palms, face, and similar lesions over limb for one year duration. Most likely diagnosis. Here there are erythematous plaques with follicular plugging and hyperpigmented border. And there are also hyperpigmented plaques over the conca and the face. It's discoid lupus erythematosus. It usually present with well-defined erythematous plaques with varying size from few millimeters to 10 to 15 centimeter with central atrophy and adherent scales with hyperpigmented border due to basal cell degeneration. And usually patient is disseminated DLE. That's mean DLE involving both head and uh, extending beyond the neck involving trunk. Uh, they are having around 22% of risk of progress into SLE, whereas in localized DLE, that means DLE confined to head and neck, they are having less chance of progress to SLE, like 1.2 percent. Thirty-eight-year-old housewife diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis for five years duration, presented with rapidly progressive, intractable, painful low limb ulcer for three weeks duration. Diagnosed.
case of pyoderma granulosum. Uh, pyoderma granulosum presenting as intractable painful ulcer with uh, necrotic base and edges usually undermined with violaceous border. And pyoderma granulosum can associate with inflammatory bowel disease, hematological malignancies, and rheumatoid arthritis. Here, vasculitis is unlikely as there is a single lesion and which is unilateral. Usually, vasculitis is also a possibility, but it's biopsy proven. And uh, the clinical features with violaceous border more towards pyoderma ganginosa. This 24-year-old uh, male diagnosed with tubercular leprosy on MDTPB treatment for six weeks duration, presented with fever, facial swelling, and generalized macular papular rash for three days duration. Uh, most likely diagnosis. Here there is macular papular lesions you can appreciate here and here also and facial swelling. Uh, it's a case of drug reaction with eosinophilia and systemic symptoms we call this DRESS syndrome. It's, uh, it's a form of delayed type of hypersensitivity reaction, usually time interval uh, from the intake of culpit drug to presentation, usually nearly three to six weeks because if it, it's a delayed type of hypersensitivity reaction. And common drugs include in our setup, mostly it's due to Dapsone, due to, uh, due to uh, lip, uh, leprosy treatment and also anticonvulsant, allopurinol and minocycline are culpit drugs. There are criteria to diagnose this one, but usually all the criteria we can't uh, fulfill in our setups, but clinically we can diagnose this one, uh, this syndrome. They can have fever and lymphadenopathy and circulating atypical lymphocytes, peripheral eosinophilia, and skin involvement, extent of cutaneous eruption more than 50%, and biopsy suggestive of breast syndrome, and other organ involvement, usually liver, and is the most commonly affected organ. And apart from that, a resolution after 15 days, and laboratory criteria. Ideally, we have to do ANA, uh, blood cultures, and hepatitis uh, A, B, and serology but uh, in our setup we usually with the fever and with culpit drug with clinical clinical features we diagnose breast syndrome and start uh, stop the culpit drug and start uh, uh, usually high dose of oral prednisolone Sixty-seven year old diagnosed patient with pulmonary tuberculosis presented with diarrhea and neck rash for two weeks duration. Most likely diagnosis and causative drug for above entity. It's a case of pellagra. Probably, uh, it's commonly due to isoniazide. Uh, in her regime, she's treating for pulmonary tuberculosis. It's presenting with, uh, there is uh, uh, hyperpigmentation over here and flaky paint-like uh, lesions over the neck region. And it's commonly affecting this neck region. So it's a case of pellagra. They can also have, at the towards the end of the disease course, they can have diarrhea, dementia, 
like features. This 10 year old uh, boy diagnosed type 1 diabetes mellitus presented with multiple crops of asymptomatic rash show all four limbs for one month, one month diagnosis. Here you can see the lesion. Uh, it's granuloma annulare. It's presenting its skin colored yeah. papules coalescing to form annular plaque without any epidermal changes. There are no surface scaling like thing. And it can be associated with diabetes mellitus. And it's also reported that realin children with type 1 diabetes mellitus can also have granuloma annulare. And it also can associate with lymphoma, HIV, and solid organ tumors like prostate. Carcinoma. Seven year old boy presented with patchy alopecia of the scalp for two weeks duration, most likely diagnosis. Here you can see the patch of scaling here. It's tinea capitis, it's patchy non-scarring alopecia with surface scaling. Scale can, that tiny scale is obvious here. This is tinea capitis. So here, more inflammatory type of uh, sophilic dermatophyte infection causes, causing uh, inflammatory tinea infection of the scale. There is kirion, we call it kirion with boggy mass and crusting. And to differentiate these are infective ones. This is autoimmune one. This is alopecia areata. Here you can appreciate there is patch of non-scarring alopecia and there are no epidermal changes. Basically skin is normal. So this is alopecia areata. This is tinea cavities and this one is kirion. For kirion we have tinea cavities we have to treat it antifungals and this is autoimmune one and usually According to the disease stage, we use uh, oral uh, topical corticosteroid and oral uh, oral co mini pulses, oral steroids, and uh, local applications like tacrolimus, depending on the stage of the disease and severity of the disease. Forty-nine-year-old painter presented with painful proximal muscle weakness for five-month duration, and rapidly progressive shortness of breath for two weeks. And he had plantar rash, plantar rash over interphalange, interphalange joints for two weeks diagnosis. Sorry, palmar, palmar rash over interphalangeal joint for two weeks. Sorry. Here you can appreciate there is ulcer and some violaceous vetiform like lesion over here and over here.
uh, that patient had reverse good trend sign of dermatomyositis and that were the only cutaneous features he had but typically dermatomyositis presenting with this periorbital swelling with violaceous hue we call that a heliotrope rash and here you can appreciate poikilo dermatous lesion involving malaria region and involving nasopharyngeal labial fold as well and here poikilo derma involving uh, back of the neck we call it shoal sign and there are lichenoid type of lesion involving knuckles we call this gotten papules and they also can have ragged cuticles so these are some of the cutaneous features of dermatomyositis a 22 year old previously healthy housewife presented with asymptomatic plaque over right sole for 5 months examination revealed right inguinal lymphadenopathy most likely diagnosis here there is asymmetric ill defined hyperpigmented ulcerated plaque over the sole so it's a case of acral lentiginous melanoma and melanoma is somewhat rare in sri lanka but acral lentiginous melanoma is the most common subtype in a darker skin type account for nearly 50% of all the melanoma cases and there is abcd rule that to how to differentiate it melanocytic nevus from malignant melanoma mainly asymmetry and irregular borders color variability and diameter more than 6 mm and evolution there may be ulceration in rapid enlargement uh, like changes so this is case of acral lentiginous melanoma okay. 39 year old lady presented with multiple crops of painful ulcers over low limb for 2 months duration she denied constitutional symptoms incisional biopsy from the ulcer showed necrotizing vasculitis of small and medium sized vessels and ka ana retroviral cryoglobulin hepatitis b and c screening were negative arterial and venous doppler scan of the lower limb were normal most likely diagnosis here there are multiple necrotic ulcers in lower limb both the both limbs it's a, it's cutaneous polyarthritis nodosa so um, there are clinical findings they can have paniculitis type of lesion livedo reticularis perperian or punched out ulcers and biopsy there are evidence of small and medium vessel vasculitis and there are no evidence of systemic vasculitis we usually seen in Uh, systemic polyarthritis nodosa like fever weight loss hypertension renal involvement ischemic event myocardial infarct infarction mesenteric ischemia neuropathy neuropathy like uh, no other features suggestive of systemic involvement and there are the arteriography is usually compatible uh, changes in the arteriography so this is a case of cutaneous polyarthritis nodosa Uh, 34 year old female with right low limb cellulitis presented with mild fever and pustular rash over face neck 
upper limb axilla growing for one day. Four days back, she was prescribed oral squamous clave. She denied past history of psoriasis. Here you can appreciate uh, there are discrete non follicular pustules over both limbs and involving neck region. It's uh, acute generalized exanthematous pustulosis, and it's occur around four days after after the culpit drug. It's a common dra drug reaction, and common drugs are usually antibiotics: penicillin, cephalosporin, clindamycin. These are the mostly antibiotics of the culpit drug, and they are having some clinical and laboratory criteria there for the diagnosis. But usually, these are not always present in in a patient. They can have rapid development of fever, uh, clinical features of dozens to hundreds of pinhead non-follicular pustules, leukocytosis, and smear and culture are negative for bacteria, rapid resolution after vomiting of culpit drug. Histology, they are intra or subcutaneous fungiform pustules, eosinophils in the pustules or dermis, necrotic, necrotic keratinocyte, Superficial interstitial or mid-dermal infiltrate, rich in neutrophil, absence of tortuous dilated blood vessels. So these are the features of AGEP. So we have to differentiate AGEP from pustular psoriasis. There, there is also non-folicular discrete pustules, but they are tend to coalesce together. Here you can appreciate that there is pustules and coalesce together to form lakes of pustules and the underlying erythema is there and pig there is pigmentation at the center. So these lakes of pustules more towards pustular psoriasis in compared to AGEP there are non-follicular discrete pustules are here. Thirty-eight-year-old Mason presented with asymptomatic plaques or shins for six months. He gives a past history of neck pain, diarrhea, and tremors. Most likely diagnosis. It's a case of pre-TBL mixedema. Uh, there is uh, erythematous pure orange like uh, infiltra orange infiltration or both skin and look skin is look little bit shiny due to mucine deposition. Twenty-nine year old female diagnosed with leprosy on MBMDT presented with fever, arthralgia, myalgia, and multiple crops of painful erythematous nodules. Involving trunk and limbs, most likely diagnosis. Here you can appreciate multiple erythematous nodules are here. It's it's a case of erythema nodosum leprosum. Uh, they usually present with multiple painful erythematous nodule or limbs. Uh, it's due to type 3 hypersensitivity reaction due to leprosy bacilli antigen. Seventeen year old student diagnosed with SLE presented with painful discoloration of both feet. For two days duration, what is the clinical entity shown here? Uh, this is the lesion. There is multiple 
purporic lesion and evidence of impending necrosis here. So it's a, it's retiform purpura. Uh, there is reticulated eruption. It's a reticulated eruption of vascular origin due to compromised blood flow. There is purpura and it, there may be necrosis. At the edge of the lesion, there are serpentine patterns. This pattern is there. Serpentine pattern. This is retiform purpura. Retiform purpura can be non-inflammatory or inflammatory in origin. Inflammatory origin, it can be due to medium vessel vasculitis. And non-inflammatory, it can be due to vasculopathy. Both vasculopathy and vasculitis mixture can be seen in conditions like sepsis. So here, you, vasculopathy, mainly they can have uh, two-thirds of lesion. There is central frank necrosis. And outer one-third, there is mild erythema. It's more in vasculopathic causes due to vessel lumen obstruction. In compare, in vasculitis, erythema is more predominant. Two third, around two third is erythema. Around one third, like in the center, is necrosis. If erythema is more, it's more toward the vasculitis. If more ne central necrosis, it's more toward the vasculopathy. But mixture can be seen in sepsis. Last case, 28 year old female from Moratua presented with erythematous to copper color plaque over both cheeks and abdomen, and there were a total of eight plaques for three years duration, most likely diagnosis. Lesions are here, and here also both cheeks, here. So it's a case of borderline tubercular leprosy. Here you can appreciate copper color irregular. Usually they are anesthetic plaques with donut shape. And here they are donuts, uh, they are pseudophodia there. So these uh, features are suggestive of borderline tubercular leprosy. Thank you. Thank you to all our speakers. The floor is now open for any question. If anyone joining us online has any questions, you are welcome to on your mic and ask them. Um, this is not a question, actually, a small comment on Bhagya's presentation. Uh, that was a fantastic collection of pictures, but uh, the last picture, uh, rather than borderline tuberculoid, I would put it as mid-borderline. Uh, the donut lesion is typical of mid-borderline rather than borderline tuberculoid. With borderline tuberculoid, it will be more, uh, the border would not be so donut-like. Usually, you put uh, the donut lesion at the BB hole. Just a comment. Uh, but I'm, I'm really happy with those, uh, that collection of pictures. That's fantastic. Any other questions or comments? In the absence of any other questions, I would like to thank the Sri Lanka College of Dermatologists for collaborating with us, the SLMA, this afternoon for the monthly clinical meeting. And I would like to uh, call upon Dr. Vinya Ratna, President Sri Lanka Medical Association, to uh, give the tokens of appreciation.
Dr. Kishani Rajakaruna. Dr. Amanda Dantanarayana. Dr. Bhagya Fernando. And Dr. Janaka Karavita. Thank you, everyone. That brings an end to the monthly clinical meeting. We hope to see you all again next week at the next session.